I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're diving into the uproarious life story of Dick Gary, author of a terrific book. It is called Just Another Dick, the presumptuous memoir of a truly unimportant person. This laugh out loud memoir takes us on a wild ride through the author's unconventional journey from being kicked out of college and bartending in Atlantic City to becoming a top radio executive in New York. Filled with colorful misadventures and surprising twists, the author's story proves that taking the road less travel can lead to great success. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Books to Life Marketing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his amazing book. The links are below the interview. Dick, thank you so much for being our guest again here today on Spotlight. Thanks so much for having me. And I really like that description of uproarious. <laughs> <laughs> it is uproarious. There's so many great misadventures in this book. Uh, you've got a great sense of humor and it shines through. And I think that's probably a big part of your success, your sense of humor. I think uh, people like to be around people who like to laugh, who like to joke, who don't take themselves too seriously. And just by the title of this book, we know you don't take yourself too seriously. So do you agree with me? That's a big ingredient when it comes to being successful. Well, that can also get you in trouble at times, too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, for me, humor is uh, humor is kind of my religion. I, I, I love it. I, you know, I'm half Irish, so that may account for some of it. But uh, I, I just think that, I love humor. I love to laugh. I love to make people laugh. And uh, and I guess when I sat down to write the book, I didn't have that so much as a dictate, but that's just the way I kind of describe things. And that's kind of the way they happened. You know, there were other things too that I uh, spent time in. I, uh, I ran a motorcycle and car racetrack, uh, which was a lot of fun because I was a fanatic motorcyclist and living in New York, you know, who needs a car? Uh, but, uh, and then in New York, I worked, uh, and this was a lot of fun too. I worked for Ed Koch when yeah. he was running for uh, Congress. And those things were you know, very different, mm -hmm. but also they taught me a lot. And, um, and hopefully when I transcribed it into the book, it uh, made people laugh. Yeah, absolutely. One of my bosses at CBS years ago told me that one of the best things to happen to you is to get a swift kick in the pants every now and then because it shakes things up. You got kicked out of college. That's certainly a kick in the pants, but it certainly didn't stop you. It certainly didn't deter you. In some ways, it kind of propelled you on your pathway to success. So tell us about that pivotal point in your life, why you got kicked out of college, what it meant at the time, did it seem devastating, and how you turned things around despite that derailment that was uh, obviously just momentary. Well, you know, I never really was a planner uh, for my future. I had no idea. I gave it no thought. I, I went to Villanova because my friend Stooji was going there. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I thought, I don't know, I got uh, after, after at the end of my freshman year, uh, some of the priests were maybe dropping off donors and they saw some of us after a, a night with Jose Cuervo uh, attempting to sing and make noise. And uh, we were told to go and see uh, the dean of men the following morning. And uh I th he thought that was nine o'clock. I thought it was when I woke up, you know, and I regained consciousness. And anyway, uh, he told me we had a few things. He told me there are three people who shouldn't drink. Uh, was it the Irish, the compulsive, and the creative? And I said, bingo. And uh, that was not the line he was looking for. Anyway, he said, you're not fit to live with Christian gentlemen. And I said, where would I find them? And he said, no, on this campus. <laughs> so I had to move off campus. And I wound up living with uh, some guys in a 10-acre estate in this old uh, this old mansion that would probably be in the next issue of 
architectural disgust. Uh, I mean, it was a dump, but it was cheaper living on campus. But I stopped going to class, and uh, uh, I was I was reading though, but I wasn't reading what they were reading, and um, uh, and I wound up with four Fs and two Ds. And I explained to someone, I said, I can't understand it. I passed all my classes. And he said, Did you ever stop in? Uh, so. I didn't stop in. So anyway, uh, then I took that and and went to Atlantic City, got a job as, in the summer as a bartender in a state that wasn't legally old enough to, uh, you know, to uh, drink. drink. And uh, shortly after that, I went in the army and that was a gas. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I was in Germany for two years. They made me an MP of all things. They wow. must have checked to see my, my record or something, know that I had experience. Uh, but, um, and I got out and had a couple of stupid jobs and then I got lucky. I was gonna go back to college. I realized I was on a freeway to nowhere and uh, I was gonna go back to college, but um, I had to get a job. And it was a New York employment agency and, uh, I read the ad and it sounded like they were looking for a lifeguard at a women's health club or something, which I thought could be fun until I... Sounds uh, fun. Turns out it wasn't. Uh, the job <laughs> was a chaser in Harlem to chase people that weren't paying their bills. Wow. And, you know, just as many African-Americans hadn't been welcome in other places, whites weren't too welcome in Harlem. So I said, no. And he said, I have one other job. Uh, a salesman announcer at an FM station. And I said, I'm not an announcer. And in his best New York voice, he says, I understand. And you're probably too busy to go on the interviews. So I said, the hell with you, I'll go on the interview. And I went and I got the job, although I, I didn't even know what FM was in those days, 1963. Right. I mean, it was nothing. And uh, that was the beginning. I really liked it. I liked the idea. I had been trying to sell cars in a summer resort in the winter and sell $275 vacuum cleaners in 1963. And I liked the idea of the abstract, of the creative. I got to write the commercials. And I also got to, it was a small station, only six, uh, there were only six employees, you know, like two engineers. Uh, I was the salesman, but I also got to write other commercials. I wound up doing... If, in those days, if you could sell something on those FM stations, they'd air it. So yeah. I was a ski freak, so I sold two ski shows. I wound up with a music show, and I did the uh, uh, the financial report. But I got to know radio in all its aspects, and I really liked it. And then uh, I wound up as a sales manager, and then a larger company bought it. And uh, after a few years, I wound up as the general manager. I was a general manager of uh, New York radio station, the youngest one, you know. And WNEW, um, wasn't there something like that? It was a big I one. Wish. <laughs> 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 no, W was funny. Uh, w, well, uh, WNEWFM called me and said, yeah, I'd like to talk to you. They had an all-female format at the time. Mm -hmm. And these women had never, they had no experience, and there was really nobody listening. And uh, so the guy said, how much do you want to make? And I said, I want to make 15000 a year, believe it or not. And he said, wow, really? I said, yeah. He said, I, do you think you can? I said, yeah. I said, have you listened to your station lately? <laughs> that was the end of w -E w And I got a, a, the first rock station uh, in FM was WOR. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a sales job, and I went back to quit and the uh general manager who is still a good friend of mine had uh he made the sale made me sales manager that day Amazing. so I mean, it was uh you know it was a, a medium i really liked but then when i moved out to california i was working uh in uh radio and i was working in background music stations and I honestly thought that, the, you know, hardly anyone was awake out there listening mm -hmm. to them. And I kind of thought that I, you know, for all my goofing around, I've always been honest and ethical. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm just taking money from some of these small businesses. 
So my wife, Elsa, and I then went into uh, our own advertising agency. And because in New York, I had changed the format of the station I managed from uh, a background music, you know, to pop. So I knew something about pop. And through one thing or another, I wound up getting involved in music. And uh, we became the primary advertising agency for the major labels in New York, LA, and Nashville. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. When you look at your rise in radio, it sounds like something out of how to succeed in business without really trying. <laughs> you know, you start out on a phone call to an employment agency of all things. You know, the guy basically dares you to go on the interview. And then within a couple of years, you're running the shop. Uh, I think that's quite amazing. Um, and uh, what do you attribute that to? Just being a compliment competent person who's also likable because I, I do think the personality factor comes in big when it comes to uh, succeeding because people want to work with people they like to get blessed into that club. You know what I mean? I, yes, I, I you're right. And I, I think what it really, uh, you know, when I got out of the army and I was selling vacuum cleaners and I was selling uh, cars in the summer resort in the winter, yeah. I became a good salesman. And well, not just a good salesman, but I understood people, you know, I understood motivations and things. And I worked to address those. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the worst story was when I was selling the cars and I saw a picture of a car that was T-boned by a train and the guy was in the hospital. And I called him and said, look like you're gonna need some new wheels. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw people think that well, I sold them a car, you know, and it was just other situations that I, you know, have in the book. But um, I think that, and I, you know, I like people. I like people that aren't jerks. I have no, no uh, patience uh, otherwise. And that's where my mouth gets me into a lot of trouble. But uh, I mean, I was lucky. I liked all my bosses too. We got along, and you know, years later, we're still friendly. That's great. And I think with the uh, uh, with the uh, one more quick story, or sure, two, we got tons uh, of time. Well, I heard that there was a at that time. You know, cigarettes were fifty two week advertisers, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they had the attorney general had not yet. Uh, you know, condemned, warning you know, on them and all that stuff. Answer, yeah. yeah. And I heard there was a new buyer at this uh, uh, agency they gave me. Mm -hmm. And we had no ratings, you know, as an FM station, we had no ratings. Mm -hmm. And I heard she was really tough. So I had an appointment with her and she says, well, tell me about your station. I said, well, we've got a lot of big plans. First thing, we're going to try and get our FCC license back. <laughs> And she laughed and laughed, and That's I got great. two weeks of business, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's what people want. They want the human connection. They want to laugh. Mostly anybody can do the job, generally, you know, because it takes a certain amount of intelligence and you can do it, particularly in our field, in media. You don't have to be a genius, you know yeah. what I mean? But you do have to be likable. You do have to have common sense. You do have to be able to forge good relationships because it's a small industry. So the guy who's working for you tomorrow might be working for you the next day and hiring you. And, you know, it's that kind of field, right? Yeah. And it's interesting, uh, you know, to advertising agencies, ratings were everything, you know, and and. I wound up as sales manager for a uh, classical FM station in Los Angeles. I had never heard a classical song in my life, you know? <laughs> but uh, one of the first things I did was I canceled the rating service and put the money into research to prove that our audience were people who actually had to eat and had to drive cars and had to do things that other people had to do. They weren't some set of freaks. Right. And that worked. Great. Yeah. So there you were thinking outside of the box. And again, yeah. you know, being a nonconformist uh, helps as well when it comes <laughs> to distinguishing yourself, which clearly you, uh, 
you know, uh, you exhibited when you were wising off to the uh, the dean of men at your university, deciding <laughs> your fate, you know? So that's great. Ed Koch is one of the most colorful characters in politics. I felt he was a really unifying figure, whether you were on the left or right. The guy called a spade a spade. He was honest. Um, checked in with the uh, voters every day by asking, how am I, how am I doing? Uh, you had the pleasure of working with this great man. Uh, tell us a little bit about your role there, what it was like working with him, and what it was like transforming the city. You know, he rode, he brought the city back during some tough times. And I'm so glad that the Queensboro Bridge was renamed the Edcott, you know? Absolutely. Well, I, the, our attorney at the racetrack was Ed's law partner when he was a uh, city councilman. Hmm. So he got me involved, and I wound up running a storefront for Ed uh, every single evening and every weekend, Thoid mm. uh, Avenue and Thoidy Thoid Street, you know? Thoidy Thoid and Thoid. I was on his advertising, obviously being managing a radio station, but in New York City, a congressional candidate can walk their district in a day. Mm. Here in Utah, they can't drive it on a full tank of gas, you know. Uh, right. And so uh, that wasn't, uh, but a lot of it was getting into places to uh, distribute your stuff. And, and obviously the one-on-one, -on -one, the personal thing. And Ed was that. I mean, he was at subway stations. He would come up to my office in the morning, uh, my, excuse me, my apartment in the morning and pick me up because I had all the materials and everything. And he liked the subway station that I lived by. But, and New Yorkers are, I love New Yorkers. I love them. They don't give crap anything they say. And uh, they, um, uh, once we, after he was elected, we were at a subway station and some woman says to him, Gotch, what do you want from me now? Didn't we just elect you? And he says, Adam, I am not a beggar. I am your congressman. You know? <laughs> just, he just told it like it was, and he was fabulous. Great. It was great. He was a straight shooter, that's for sure. We need an Ed Koch today more than ever, because uh, we need some unifying figures out there. Everybody looks to polarize in order to build support. And that works. It works to divide half the country and say, you know, you're for this or for that. But it also works to bring people together. And Ed Koch was an example of that for sure. And so I'm sure that's one of your prouder moments working with such a great man as well. Also interesting in your resume, we talked about it a little bit before, but was running a racetrack for cars and motorcycles. It seems like it's a 180 degree turn in your career. Where did you do this? Tell us a little bit about it and what kind of life lessons you learned from doing that. Well, um, you know, I was always a, uh, a race freak. Uh, I really loved racing. I liked midget cars, Indy cars, you know, I liked motorcycles and living in New York. I had a motorcycle instead of a car, you know, and, uh, and uh, this was, and there was a racetrack in Bridgehampton, Long Island, uh, you know, out in the fashionable Hamptons where um, it, it had closed. The guy just, I don't know, didn't make any money or whatever, but it was it was empty. And one night, two friends and myself, one of them had a, a, a summer place out there. And we, again, spent the evening with Jose Cuervo and decided that uh, we should take over the racetrack, you know, because they were also fanatics. Uh, one guy was in advertising, one guy was in television. So the next morning, we still wanted to do that. And I knew a guy who owned the local gas station who was a member of the board. So I went and talked to him and uh, he set up a meeting for us with the rest of the board of the racetrack, Bridgehampton Race Circuit. And uh, they, they, they leased it to us for like $7,500 a year. And, and we had to do a lot of things. We had to, uh, we sold a couple of bridges. We sold sponsorships, you know, and then we had to get races and, and it was very tough. Um, and then we decided let's try and do motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. That was the most fun because, you know, we made a weekend of it. 
free free camping for most of, the local newspaper thought we were going to destroy the town you know but right. uh, it, it wasn't that wasn't the case they were great they, i think that maybe they were happy to be welcome someplace but we had all kinds of events we did wheelie contests for spectators and some guy took a harley sportster and rode it around the three mile track on its rear wheels you know and uh uh, so there was a lot, I mean, there was a lot of work involved in it. Uh, there was a, a restaurant in New York that was the headquarters, Chanticleer was the headquarters kind of for the racing community. And we went there so often, I thought one of the first injuries would be one of us getting the gout or something, you know, I mean, it was just, uh, but it, 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 you know, it was a, it was a serious business. And I think it's one of the things that also, Help me, uh, you know, I mean, being a, an entrepreneur, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, running our own thing. Uh, and uh, we would rent it to companies who, you know, were uh, making commercials and things. And uh, they wanted me to drive sometimes. So uh, I uh, I got paid for that uh, <laughs> on the side, you know, and that. Uh, and uh, I got, I had to switch a dial once when they were shooting something and I got paid for a hand model. And, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, but I wasn't naive, you know, SAG, um, they wanted to do another commercial and they, your SAG allows you, you probably know, to do one for free and then you have to uh, join. And they said, right. okay, you to join SAG. I said, I'm not gonna join SAG. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. So they paid for me to join SAG. And meanwhile, my wife at that time was trying to be an actress. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't too popular. That's funny. You got your SAG card before she got her SAG card. Oh, she that, couldn't get hers. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. funny. Yeah, that's the conundrum of being an actor. You have to work in order to join the union. And sometimes you have to join the union in order to work. So it's yeah. a catch-22, but we work our way around it like you did, which is great as well. Were you raised in New York City? You sound like a New York City kid. I was I was raised, I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. And lived in Queens for a little while and then moved to Manhasset, Long Island when I was pretty young. And it was kind of interesting because Manhasset was a kind of wannabe town. Mm -hmm. And I found this bar where people didn't want to be, you know, and a bunch of guys that had a, a sharp sense of humor, they were intelligent, and they had kind of a quirky view of the world. But my father was, he had to quit high school when he was 15 because his father died. He lived in a Polish section of downtown uh, New York. Mm. And uh, he, he, he also didn't want to be, you know, he, uh, was not too nuts about that. And I think I got a lot of that from him. He passed on, unfortunately, when I was 15. But I think he planted some seeds there that, uh, you know, kind of the no BS kind of stuff that uh, I I like. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure Manhattan has a changed place from when you were growing up. Now it's like, you know, the Gold Coast of Long Island. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, it's a real fancy place. Very, very, very nice. Well, when I was 10, we started, uh, another guy and myself, they were, it had been a golf course, I guess, and uh, they were, you know, the war started and they hadn't finished developing it. And we started making um, soft drinks and, you know, Kool-Aids and stuff and taking it to the work, you know, so I really started working when I was 10 and I was a pin boy and I was a clerk and a, you know, uh, a dishwasher and, you know, all that stuff. Oh. that's real it really helps you i think oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah i i think that's what's missing among the young people today I i'm like you when i was like 12 years old i was working at a country club washing dishes 14 years old, I'm working as a deli clerk, you know, and did all yeah. those jobs that nobody wants to do, but learning tremendous life lessons from entrepreneurs along the way and being mentored at a very young age and getting your brain geared for business. So I think those jobs are absolutely <clears throat> valuable. And uh, it's a shame that more kids don't do it today. Instead, they just stay coddled by their parents who helicopter around them, make sure they're not hurt or injured or their feelings are hurt, right? Yeah, I remember, you know, we lived in Malibu in California, which has such a, you know, a marvelous name. And 
But I lived there for 40 years. And when I moved there, it wasn't that way. But by the time we were leaving, I mean, the, the, uh, the lumber yard was a, a series of international boutiques. But you'd see kids walking around with their pants half off, trying to look poor. And I'm thinking, you know, you really, <laughs> you really ought to try it sometime. You know, I, mean, I remember at one point when I was, before I got the radio job, you know, three of us were renting a seedy house someplace. Two of us would split the rent and the third guy pay the utilities and he didn't. Mm. And so they shut off the, uh, they shut off the heat uh, and the gas. And um, I used to make uh, instant coffee. I plugged the, uh, we had electric. I plugged the, I'd fill the steam iron, plug it in and then pour it over the coffee grinds when it got hot, you know, so. <laughs> but those funny. are things that, you know, they're, they're real. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what, if you know you can survive that, it gives you the strength to know you can survive everything. It also gives you the perspective to know that, hey, this is good, this is great. This is wonderful that I've been promoted to this or I've been given that or I'm making this salary now. When you have there's something really important about having humble origins and from and remembering from whence you came, don't you think? Yeah, I think that those experiences too, in my case, kind of made you unafraid to take a chance. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, there's so many people whose lives are spent unhappily, you know, and I think if you're unhappy, you got to change it. You only get one life, you know, and, and for me, boredom is uh, an arch enemy, you know, and oh, yeah. I, but I think that, I think just that, doing all those things and, you know, uh, it just, I wasn't afraid to take a chance. That's why later on you were going from, you know, college to bartender, bartending to selling cars to selling vacuums to joining the radio station. I mean, you were just ready to go in any direction, wherever you saw opportunity and whatever you needed to do to, you know, get through a tough patch at times, which is what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, it's part of it. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give somebody today? who is starting out, who doesn't want to live a conventional life, who wants to have some of those adventures and misadventures and mishaps and excitement that you had in your career. Tell us what advice you give to a young guy starting out or a young gal starting out today. I, I think um, believe in yourself a little bit, you know, be willing to take a chance. I mean, uh, if, if this one doesn't work, there's another one down the street. Don't this, with the chance you take is not the last one you'll ever get. Right. And, and I also think be honest and ethical. I found out, and, you know, as a salesman in, in, in that doing that, I would build relationships instead of one shots. So I think building relationships where you can, and knowing something about the chance you're going to take maybe is nice too. Uh, but, but don't be afraid to do it because there are so many people who won't, yeah. you know, and you only get one life. Exactly. So you want it to be a happy one and a satisfying one. And if you're unhappy, you have to make a change. Exactly. Exactly. And it takes guts sometimes to make a change, but uh, guts are what what are needed at times and uh, great advice across the board. Um, interesting conversation today. The name of the book, if you want to hear more about Dick Gary's wonderful adventures and misadventures is called Just Another Dick, the presumptuous memoir of a truly unimportant person. Of course, he is just the polar opposite of that. He's done a lot of important things, but this book is a laugh out loud memoir that takes you on a wild ride through his unconventional journey from being kicked out of college, as we mentioned, to bartending in New York City, to becoming a top radio executive in New York City, which I gotta tell you, ain't easy. Dick, thank you so okay. much for joining you us here today. You can get it at uh, Just Another Dick at Amazon.com. <laughs> just Another Dick at Amazon.com? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or is it Just Another Dick.com or Just Another Dick at Amazon.com? Just Amazon. Another com. Dick at Amazon.com. Okay. Just Another Dick at Amazon.com. You want to get that domain perfectly correct 
or we're yes. not responsible for where it may lead you. Okay. <laughs> Dick, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. It, it's always fun to uh, talk to you. It's great. Thanks. Great talking to you as well. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.